Thank you for coming by for my Wednesday Bible study. It's Wednesday, October 2nd, 2024. Starting a new study today, and we are going to go through the entire book of Acts. And what I'm going to do is talk about restoring the New Testament church, which if you want to do that, go back to the book of Acts and see the New Testament church and then start acting like it, you know restore the New Testament church. I'm going to give you six principles for restoring the New Testament church today. And um, now this is Wednesday, and I'm, this is for Wednesday, the 2nd of October. On Mon on Sunday, late in the day on Sunday, put out some messages on 1st and 2nd Peter. On Friday, I put out messages on the book of Ephesians that I'm going through. And I'm going through that with the church I serve. I'm a pastor of a church again at 75 years of age. Who would hire a 75-year-old preacher? Still kind of cracks me up. Lindsay Christian Church. But I'm tickled pink to be their, to be their pastor, to be their preacher. Um, let's put that out on Sunday, late in the day on Sunday, because I'm preaching and stuff earlier in the day. And then on Fridays, I put out the uh, the Ephesian messages, which are the same ones I'm preaching for the, for the church in Lindsay, California, Lindsay Christian Church. <clears throat> and then... Uh, Every, every day I do my daily devotions, except Sunday because I'm too busy. And I'll, I just share those with you, the Bible reading I've been doing for a bunch of years. And then every day I'll put out uh, a couple of short, two or three short Bible thoughts, just to kind of, I guess, hear something from the Word of God. And then if you put prayer, if you put a prayer request in the comments, I'll pick up on them and I'll put out a prayer video, get people praying for you. Okay, so let's do that stuff. I call it Christian Ministry Central. I hope you'll subscribe to my channel. Hit the bell so you get notified. Make comments. Do everything you can to help me get this out to more people. We're going to study the Bible and create ministry, okay? That's the, uh, that's the idea. Let's take just a minute and pray, and we'll jump into it. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Let's pray. Father, speak to us. Uh, change us. Take us back to the New Testament. Help us to imitate the uh, church of the New Testament and restore New Testament Christianity. Teach us today, Father, by your word. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, okay, you know, our son is 47 years old. Not a baby anymore. He was once. But back when our son was born, I was a youth minister, okay? And I'll always be a re recovering youth minister, but it was an amazing time in life, actually. And I was at the Lawndale Christian Church in Lawndale, California, and I was a youth minister. We had a baby dedication when our son was born. We named him. He still named this. He never go. We're never gone by this. Went always goes by Jeremy. But his name was Jeremiah Daniel West. Now two Old Testament prophets. Now Herb Reed was the senior minister in that church. In those, this is 1977. Okay. And when we had the baby dedication with our son. Herb said to my wife and I, Tom and Becky, you named him Jeremiah, Jeremiah Daniel, two great Old Testament prophets. I thought you were New Testament Christians. Ha, ha, ha. Big, you know, everybody laughed. And I am a New Testament Christian and believe in restoring New Testament Christianity. That's a big thing for me. Always has been. The book of Acts records the first 33 years of the life of the New Testament church. If you want to know what the New Testament church was like, go back to the book of Acts. Study it. Take it seriously. Okay, that's what we're going to do in this study. We get restoration right when we rediscover and get back to the original church in the book of Acts. That's where we need to go. We're going to take a good look at that. We're going to study that. Look at first, first, first Acts 1, verses 1 through 5. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay, I call this the basics, and there are three basics that, that are always going to be there. First, in, this is Acts. Acts is volume two 
of Luke Acts. Luke is the first volume. And um, in fact, if we go back and look at Luke 1, 1 through 4, we're going to do that real quick. Luke 1, 1 through 4. We'll, we'll see that it was addressed to Theophilus 2 as well. Luke, Luke 1, 1 through 4. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the, of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know with certainty of the things that have been taught. Okay, he's writing an account and the first volume of it is the book of Luke, okay? And it, Luke covers the first 33 years of Jesus, the 33 years of Jesus' life, okay? And then the book of Acts covers the 33 years of Jesus living his life through the church. Now, it's addressed to Theophilus. The name means lover of God. He was some sort of official probably somewhere, and he addresses this to him so that he could know the things that were clearly taught. But the book of Acts covers the first 33 years of Jesus living his life through his people, the, the church. And it defines the church. And it shows us the early church. If you want to go back to when the thing was at its purest, go back to when it was started. Just like if a child is born, they're purest and not defiled at birth. The church was at its purest and undefiled at its birth. That's in Acts 1 and 2, okay? And the rest of the book of Acts gives us what the early church should look like. If you want to restore the church, do it like it was restored. Do it like it was in the book of Acts, and you'll restore it. That's the idea. That's, that's our aim. Secondly, Jesus presented himself alive to his apostles. This is a big deal. He appeared many times to them, and he did that over a period of 40 days, okay? 40 days is kind of, remember Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days. The Israelites, you know, were 40 days, 40 years in the wilderness, okay? 40 seems to be a, an interesting number. So here's the big deal, though. Believing that Jesus was alive was essential. It was essential then, it's essential now. You gotta believe in the resurrection. New, Tes New Testament Christianity cannot be restored without affirming and believing the resurrection, which is obvious to anyone who takes a look at the New Testament. What did Jesus speak about during the 40 days? This is important. This is a big deal. He spoke about the kingdom of God during the 40 days. Now, so what is the kingdom of God? Okay, this is important. This is missed constantly. The kingdom of God is the rule of Jesus as Lord inside of us. The kingdom is that over which a king rules. King Jesus rules over us. He's Lord. Called Lord over 600 times in the New Testament. That's about 200 times more than he's called Jesus. The Lord is the ruler over the king. He's the king. Jesus is. And he is, he is our king when we surrender to his rulership. So the rule of Jesus as Lord inside of us is the kingdom today. At the day of the Lord, the kingdom will be complete and then he will rule in a new heaven and a new earth, and he imposes his kingship on the rest of creation at that point. Right now, it's voluntary. A kingdom is a concept that runs, listen, the kingdom of God starts in Genesis, runs through the 22nd chapter of Revelation. It's the concept throughout. It's all about God ruling, and he rules in the kingdom of God through Jesus, the Lord of the kingdom. Now, the third concept in those first five verses he told them to stay in Jerusalem waiting for the promised gift. Stay in Jerusalem and wait for the promised gift. The gift is coming. You know what the gift is? The gift is the Holy Spirit, the person, the presence, and the power of God. Now, in a few days, 10, he says, it says in a few days, that gift will come, and they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So 10 days from what he's, where he's talking now, the Holy Spirit would come on them. That's the gift, and they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, that meant that they he came. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came into to them in the first 
several verses of Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit came into the people of God. What that meant is that they would be dwelled in by the Holy Spirit. In fact, they would be overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit. He would come to live in them and make himself present. The person, the presence, and power of God would reside in the folks. Now, the initial establishment of the kingdom or the church happens in Acts 2 to Jews and in Acts 10 to Gentiles. The Holy Spirit came first in both of those instances. The Holy Spirit came on people to demonstrate the presence of God and the acceptance of God of those people, first of the Jews, then of the Gentiles. And it came on believers, okay? And he demonstrated his presence, the Holy Spirit did. And so that came first. After that came water baptism. After it was established, water baptism came. Now listen to Acts 2.38. Let me explain this to you. People can be, this can be very confusing to people. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, water baptism, and then the Holy Spirit baptism came with water baptism. After the initial reception, where the Holy Spirit demonstrated his presence, after that, they're combined. And you're water baptized and the Holy Spirit comes into your life. Because you say, you're saying, when you're water baptized, you're saying, I trust what Jesus did for me. I trust his death for me to pay for my sin, his, the burial, and his bodily resurrection. I'm going to experience that with him and say to Jesus, I trust you. And then it works for me. My sins are forgiven and the Holy Spirit comes into my life. It's an act of faith. So then what happens to us now, we come to Jesus in faith. We repent, we're baptized, and then our sins are forgiven and the Holy Spirit comes into our life. Initially, the Holy Spirit came first, and then they got water baptized. But the way the new covenant is established from then on, the Holy Spirit came in, came, comes into us when we're baptized, okay? That's how God set it up, and that's what he did the first time. Restoring New Testament Christianity will always be about baptism in water, and the Holy Spirit received, just like in the book of Acts, Acts 2.38. And the Holy Spirit comes into our life when we repent and are baptized. That's, that's what the book of Acts teaches. We'll get into that deeper as we get into the second chapter. Now look at Acts 1, verses 6 through 11. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father is set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky. This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Okay. When are you restoring the kingdom of Israel? That's a question that people were asking. And there are four big deals that kind of surround that question that he talks about here. Four big deals. When are you restoring the kingdom of Israel? First big deal is this. To restore the kingdom of, when do you restore the kingdom of Israel? Well, what's going on is the disciples are thinking political. They always did throughout the gospel accounts. They saw Jesus as the king who would come and replace the kingdom of Israel, to, who would come and re, uh, replace the kingdom, reestablish the kingdom of Israel, take it back to its, its great status during the time of David, its greatest king. They were looking for overthrow Rome, get rid of Rome, and reestablish the kingdom. So that's what they were asking. When are you going to do that? When are you going to make this political thing happen? And it's not political. Now, in verse 7, <clears throat> Jesus answers the question that he wanted them to ask. What happens over and over again, the disciples don't ask the right question. So what does Jesus do? He answers the right question, okay? And he wanted, the question he wanted to be asked was this, when is Jesus going to come back to, and establish his eternal kingdom? At the day of the Lord, kind of thing. When is he going to get, 
do that. Not, it's not about a political kingdom. It's about the day of the Lord. We need to remember that. It's not about politics. It's about an internal kingdom of people surrendered to Jesus. And then he's, pe people are not to know the dates the Father sets by his own authority. Let's go back and look at that again. Verse 7, I think it is. He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. You don't, you're not supposed to know that. That's what he's saying. It applies to us today. Okay, we're not supposed to know that. Uh, people are not going to know the dates the Father has set by his own authority. Look at, he talks about that at other times. Matthew 24, verse 36. Listen to this. Matthew 24, 36. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. They're asking about when you're going to come back and establish the kingdom. And what does he say? He says, only the Father knows about that day and that hour. The day and the hour of Christ's return. Only, only the Father knows that. People don't, angels don't, even Jesus does not know when when the when he's going to come back only the father knows that now why do people try to figure figure out when jesus is coming back and write books about it and do movies about it and all that kind of, why do people do that he's clear you're not going to know you're not going to know when i'm coming back so why do people do that As, frankly i don't know unless it's just to try to get attention and make money i uh, aside from that i really don't know if you listen carefully to what the Bible says, you'll figure out pretty quick, we're not going to know when he's coming back. He comes unannounced. God knows, the Father. Even Jesus doesn't know, and he's one with the Father. Think about that. Now, here's, here's my theory. I think the next verse, verse 8, is what we're supposed to be about instead of trying to figure out when he's going to come back. Listen to verse 8 again. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. There's power to witness. And the power to witness is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's power to witness for Jesus. And he would come into the people of God in the first part of the second chapter of Acts. And they were supposed to witness for Jesus bear witness to Jesus and what he did for them and his saving grace and all that kind of thing. It's the same kind of thing that he gets in in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And notice, it's not called the Great Suggestion. <laughs> it's called the Great Commission, you know, Matthew 20, 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given me. What's that leave for the rest of us? Nothing. Jesus has all the authority. What he's giving is the most authoritative statement in the history of the world. He says this, this in verse 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you to the very, always to the very end of the age. Okay, so what's supposed to happen? We're supposed to bear witness to the whole world. We're supposed to make disciples of them, make followers of Jesus. That's what a disciple is out of all nations. Nations is the word ethne. We get the word ethnic from that word. And it means people groups. Any, any way you can clump people together in groups by common characteristics is a people group. Labor unions are a people group. Republicans are a people group. Democrats are a people group. Americans are a people group. You know, different ethnic groups or people groups. We're supposed to reach them all with the good news about Jesus. We're supposed to bear witness to them and announce the good news, witness to them, and make them followers of Jesus. The other part is teaching them to obey the commands of Jesus. That's a part of what it means to make a disciple. Then he'll be with us because we're doing his work. That's the idea of bearing witness for Jesus, to get reach the world for Christ. You can't make him come to Christ. I, I like to call it life and lip evangelism. Make people thirsty by the way you live. And when they bring something up, tell them. Then start talking to them. Make them thirsty by the way you live. Make and the fact that you love them and make it obvious to them. And when they're thirsty, they'll ask you something about it. Then you can start telling them how Jesus loved them and died for them. And he's made a difference in your life and can do the same for them. So why do you suppose it's hard to witness today? It, it really, it, it, first of all, 
It's not politically correct. I could care less whether it's politically correct or not, but it's not. So, but witnessing is this simple. Here's what Jesus did for me, and then fill in the blank, and tell him what it, that he can do the same thing for other people. What did he do for Tom West? You know, he drug me out of stupid and sinful lifestyle and made me productive and sobered me up, did all kinds of funny things, you know, the uh, amazing things. That's what he, tell people what he did for you and let them know that he can do it for them. And then here's, the Holy Spirit is the power to bear witness to Jesus. You know what? Do you think the Holy Spirit's changed in the last couple thousand years? Not even a little bit. He's the same. He's the power of God. If we get out of his way and let him do what he's supposed to do, he'll help us bear witness to Jesus. Now, notice what Jesus said in verse 8 again. Okay, I'm going to read it again. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Okay? Um, notice that Jesus said, he didn't say you, you should. Listen to what he said. He said, the Holy Spirit will come on you and you will be my witnesses. When the Holy Spirit gets involved, you will be his witnesses. And there are three circles that widen that are where, where we should be Jesus' witnesses. He says, first, you're, they were in Jerusalem. That's where they were then. So you want to be his witness in Jerusalem. And then it goes out the areas around Jerusalem or Judea and Samaria want to be as witnesses in the areas close by, and then to the ends of the earth, okay? Jude Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, the areas right around them, and then to the ends of the earth. Interesting how the rest of the book of Acts works out. The book of Acts, verse, chapter 2, verse 42, through chapter 8, verse 3, is all about the people of God being a witness for Jesus in Jerusalem, Okay? And then in Acts 8, 4, 4, 4 through 12, verse 24, the book of Acts, what's going on there from there on in, it was about the people of God being a witness in Judea and Samaria, reaching those areas for Christ. And from Acts 12, 25, the next verse, to Acts 28, 31, the last verse, it's about getting it to Rome, taking the, taking the good news about Jesus to the ends of the earth. The whole book of Acts revolves around that. You want to restore New Testament Christianity, restore the mission of the church, and live out that mission like they did in Acts chapter 2. So how does that apply to us? Okay, I pastor a church in Lindsay, California. On one side of Lindsay is Exeter. On the other side of Lindsay is Strathmore, two very small towns in, uh, in Central California, San Joaquin Valley. Okay, so... I want to, we want to first be a witness in Lindsay, and then in Exeter and Strathmore, the areas right next to us, and then to the ends of the earth. That's how it applies to us today. Where do you live? Be a witness where you live, then on the towns on either side, and then to the ends of the earth. And that would include missions, supporting missionaries to take take the or go yourself, you know, to the ends of the the earth. Now, next, Jesus, the fourth thing. Okay, that's the third thing. We need to be as witness like Acts 2, 8, and Acts 1, 8. Fourth, Jesus ascends to heaven, and he's coming back the same way he ascended. I want to look at verse, uh, verses 9 through 11 again. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you've seen him go into heaven, okay? So Jesus ascends back to heaven. He's going back to, and he's coming back the same way he left. When he comes back, he's going to come back the same way he went into heaven. Jesus spent 40 days communicating with the apostles, the disciples before his ascension. Why 40 days? I think 40 has something to some kind of significance. Jesus fasted for 40 days when he was in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years. I mentioned this before. 
Maybe it's about just having, maybe 40 is time enough to finish the necessary communication, getting his disciples ready to function when he left, okay? And then verses 10 and 11, we just read them again. Two men dressed in white, could be angels, doesn't say they are, but two men dressed in white showed up. And he, they said he's coming back the same way he left. The way he left, he's going to come back the exact same way that he left. Now, if we look at Revelation 1, verse 7, let's do this. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. All I got to do is get there. Revelation 1, verse 7. Look, he's coming in, he's coming with the clouds, and every knee will see him, and those who pierced him will all, will all, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. He's coming in the clouds. How'd he leave? In the clouds. He's coming back the same way. He's coming back the same way he left, in the clouds. It, and that's important. When Jesus comes back, you know, People have said, I think he came back and we missed it. People have been saying that for about 1970 years or whatever. No one missed Jesus when he comes back. No one will be able to miss him. He's coming back in the clouds. No one's going to miss that. It'll be obvious to everybody, okay? So that's another one of the principles that you want to hang, hang back to, hang on to. Jesus is coming back the same way he left. Nobody's going to miss it when he comes back, okay? So... As we look back at these 11 verses that we've looked at, what are some principles we want to restore that are New Testament church principles that we should restore? There's six of them in this passage, okay? Number one, believing the resurrection is essential. That's basic. You can't be a Christian without believing the resurrection. You've got to believe it. Second, it's about the kingdom of God, always has been. And it's the internal rule of Jesus as Lord from inside because we've surrendered our lives to him. It's about Jesus being Lord and being under his rule. It's, so it's always about the kingdom. Third, water baptism, which includes receiving the Holy Spirit. So being restored to the New Testament church includes that and includes a whole bunch of other things, but it certainly includes that. Fourth, we don't know when Jesus will return. We know he will return, but we don't know when he will return. That is a New Testament, restoration of New Testament church principle. Fifth, God empowered us to witness. You know, like I said, I, I, I pastor church in Lindsay, and then in Strathmore and Exeter on either side, and to the ends of the earth. Our mission is to witness to the world about Jesus. That's the fifth New Testament principle. We want to do that. We want to live that way. And then sixth, Look for Jesus to come back the way he left. Those are New Testament principles. Those are things we need to embrace and hang on to and never back off of, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the book of Acts. I pray that you'd give us wisdom and that you'd work through us to restore the New Testament church. Help us to hang on to those six principles and not back off of them. That's my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.